This is a love letter to a corner of Essex I've never visited and almost but doesn't quite exist. Going on hints gleaned from conversations overheard in pub car parks and church halls, I think it's somewhere in the north of the county. Head away from the A13, the chemical factories, suburban sprawl and oil refineries in the south of Essex. Turn north from Canby Island, up past Chelmsford and Braintree, and you're getting warm. As far as I can discern, we're somewhere in the lower valley of a stour, commutable for commercial excavations in Colchester, not too far away from the sea, certainly within the broad distribution of 12th century round tower churches. This is a rural landscape, the home of John Constable, Ronald Blythe and Marjorie Allingham's detective Albert Campion. We know the name of a number of settlements in the area, including Danebury, a small market town with a fine parish church, several schools, a new age spiritual shop and a library. And most importantly, the home of the Danebury Metal Detecting Club, the DMDC. You may have seen or even own one of their popular fleeces. <laughs> it's through the eyes of the DMDC and the associated detectorists, not detectors, that I want to view this historic landscape through a series of case studies and meditations. And I want to think about the similarities and differences between detectorists and archaeologists and suggest that in terms of habits and habitats, that the two sometimes antagonistic groups may not be as different as sometimes suggested. I wanted particularly to view this landscape through the eyes of two individuals. Let's call them Andy and Lance. To be more precise, Andy Stone and Lance Stater. Stater and Stone, nominative determinism in action. As members of the DMDC, our two protagonists have been involved in a number of the most important metal detecting discoveries in recent years in North Essex. They've both also clearly worked with archaeological authorities and organisations. Andy, in particular, studied archaeology at university as a mature student and has worked on archaeological sites both locally and in Botswana although finding employment has not always been easy. In recent years, he has left archaeology behind him to focus on restoring a period property with his partner. Lance, however, having little education seemingly beyond A-levels, is clearly an autodidact with a wide general knowledge and a fondness for Linda Lusardi. It is Lance who has had the most intriguing interaction with the archaeological authorities. As I'm sure many of you will know, Lance it was who discovered the Henbury Stone Astle, one of the finest pieces of Anglo-Saxon metalwork to have been discovered in that part of Essex, rivaled perhaps only by the steeple bumpstead boss from a little further up the valley of the Stour. And like this boss, the Henbury Stone Astel was acquired by the British Museum in the case of the Astel seemingly through the Portable Antiquities Scheme. And it actually it was acquired for the princely sum of £50,000. On the way here this morning, I did check in room 41 at the British Museum, but sadly neither the Henbury Stone Astel nor the steeple, steeple bumpstead boss are on display. The closest parallel to the Henbury Stone object is, of course, the Alfred Jewel, found in North Petherton in Somerset. Astles are a poorly understood artefact type, probably intended as pointers for assisting in reading texts. They're clearly high status objects. In King Alfred's preface to his translation of Gregory the Great's Pastoral Care, he noted, and I will send a copy to every bishop's see in my kingdom, and in each book there is an astle of 50 mancuses, and I command in God's name that no man take the staff from the book, nor the book from the church. There are a series of other astles known from Britain, including the Warminster Jewel, the Minster Lovell Jewel, the Bidford Bobble, my best <laughs> name of the time, and the, and the um, Bowley's Jewel. The Henry Stone Jewel is not the only, um, not the only one found by detectorists. And the, having looked at the PAS database yesterday, indicates at least three or four others have been reported. Although curiously, the fine location of the Henry Stone example is not actually shown on the PAS map. It's not clear whether the Henry Stone example was inscribed. The Alfred Jewel, of course, as, every, as many people know, carries an inscription, Alfred mech hecht gewerken, Alfred had me made. The only object I've been able to find which has a similar inscription is the so-called sign of fire, found but not retained by one Will Stanton in the harsh winter of 1973. The associated confusing events were noted by Susan Cooper in her report on it called Dark is Rising, where it's recorded as being made of gold and bearing the inscription Lichtmichthet gewerken, light have you made. Intriguingly, the finder of a Henry Stone Astor reported suspicions of a curse following his discovery of the object. A famine of discoveries and a mysterious figure appearing in a photograph he took in whilst in the British Museum. The presence of a mysterious guardian figure attempting to prevent the discovery of, or failing that to recover, Anglo-Saxon high-status metalwork in an East Anglian, East Anglian context is not uncommon. 
Some of you may be aware of a mysterious case of an antiquarian and amateur archaeologist by the name of Paxton, who claimed to have found important royal regalia in the vicinity of Sebra in Suffolk. This incident was reported by notice manuscript scholar Montague Rhodes James in the mid-1920s. Sadly, Paxton was discovered brutally murdered by person or persons unknown. Luckily, Lance was able to assuage the vengeful spirits by making a small ritual offering. The identity of the Guardian was never clear, although if the Henry Stone Astor was one of the Astors distributed by Alfred, one can't help recalling his threat, <coughs> and I command in God's name that no man take the staff from the book, nor the book from the church, or indeed the Astor from the ground. One of the biggest areas of communality between detecting and archaeological, or archaeological communities is that of a focus on practice. They share, of course, a pursuit of the past underpinned by a variety of motives. But at their heart, one of the most defining characteristics is not just the end result, but the practice itself. For both, it is practice that offers some of the most defining terms used to describe the practitioners. Detectorists, diggers, dirt sharks. For both groups, their province is the soil, the interface between the world above ground and deeper geology, but also the interface between the present and the past, the place that can be accessed directly through digging, uncovering and revealing what lies below, but also a world that can be accessed vicariously through geophysical techniques, remote sensing, remote viewing techniques, metal detecting, satellite, aerial photographs, and of course, Google Earth. But for both groups, it's a physical aspect, almost a mindfulness of digging itself, moving Earth, cleaning, revealing, but it's important. Emotionally, it's about process and flow, and as much about the opportunities to ruminate and chew the cud as the discovery of the objects. It's also about the opportunity to be outdoors in the countryside, often, but not always. It's about the sociality of the endeavour, conversations resumed at tea breaks, private and public jokes, gossip. Have you heard what happened to old Bob Cromer? The Church Farm Roman Burial, case study number two. This is more of a joint endeavour between Lance and Andy. The end result of a long, drawn-out engagement with a rich archaeological landscape over a period of several years. The venture began with an attempt to identify the burial site of Sexred, son of Seabert and brother of Seward, who died, according to Bede, in a battle in AD 626. Of course, recent, recent publication of the Prittlewell burial found in South End by Mola has confirmed that that is certainly not the burial site of Sexred, so the discovery of his ultimate tomb still lies entirely up for grabs. Although Andy and Lance's work remained ultimately unsuccessful, though they were much closer than they actually realised, it did initiate a sustained engagement with the local landscape of Church Farm, almost, but not quite, terminated by an attempt to build a solar array on the land. At a finer chronological scale, the sequence of events that led to the discovery of the Roman burial site and hoard was initiated by the discovery of a hawking whistle, which Andy blew. The evocation of the past through blowing a whistle is one noted by the previously mentioned M.R. James, recording the experience of Parkins, the Professor of Ontography at St. James's College, uh, which took place whilst carrying out amateur archaeological endeavour on the East Anglian coast, and blowing it. When he blew the whistle, he described the tone as having a quality of infinite distance in it, and soft as it was, he somehow felt it must be audible for miles around. It was a sound, too, that seemed to have the power, which many sense possess, of forming pictures in the brain. <clears throat> Although in his published version of events, James describes this as taking place at Burnstow. He subsequently disclosed that Burnstow is in fact based on Felixstowe. Where is Felixstowe? For those who don't know, it's just over the county border in Suffolk, at the mouth of the Orwell and the Stour, surely not more than 10 miles from Henbrystone. Does the Stour Valley have a genius Loki connected with whistles or pipes? We know from the work of Kenneth Graham that some claim to have encountered a mysterious piping, having followed a river upstream where they saw a mysterious horned figure. And there's much, said to be else, much, much to be said elsewhere, perhaps at another tag, about the localisation of the great god Pan in the verdant river valleys of southern England. Put that slide in for Katie, he's not turned up. Um, for Andy, the blowing of the whistle invokes, or maybe provokes, something different. Maybe a vision, a girl blowing a whistle, watching a funeral, burying the ashes of someone once alive, alive and other things. 18th century lovers, <clears throat> trapped us from just after the war. But overall, always the magpies, always watching, 
She wants to be flowers, but you make her magpies. This vision of the sedimented past, <coughs> and second time he gets a mention today, bound together by skeins of narrative and affect, is a powerful one. This is the archaeological imagination. In the words of Michael Shanks, the archaeological imagination is rooted in a sensibility, a pervasive set of attitudes towards traces and remains, towards memory, time, the very fabric of history. The focus of his sensibility and constitutive imagination is the persistence of the past, the articulation of remains of the past to the present, recollecting or recollecting as a memory practice, bringing what is left of the past before the present, making it live again. Whilst Lance and Andy may not use the language of Michael Shanks, who does, but to them, their pursuit is about more than simple acquisition. And in the same way that archaeologists sometimes have a dismissive attitude toward detectorists, their motivation, Lance has a similar reductive perspective on archaeology, reducing our profession to acquirers and mappers of data, while seeing, while seeing detectorists as the true sto storytellers and the true people who write the narratives. As archaeologists who may dis instinctively disagree with Lance's take, while simultaneously admitting to ourselves we're not always as good about telling stories as we like to think we are. And we see here the importance of how we approach the past. Everybody, we all see ourselves as custodians of narratives. There's a lot of narratives and a lot of custodians. But back to the burial. The coin found by Lance, before being stolen by the magpie, seems to be in a gold coin of Septimius Severus. These are vanishingly rare in the British context. Indeed, indeed not a single gold aureus of Septimius Severus is reported on the Portable Antiquities web database as of 12 o'clock yesterday. The indication that it was just one coin in a larger hoard points to the exceptional importance of this isolated cremation burial. The Stour Valley was certainly an area with a high level of Roman activity, as might be expected in an area in the hinterland of a major Roman town, Colchester. There is a station in Ita 9 in the Antonine itinerary named Ad Ansem, which is listed 15 <coughs> miles from Combrotovium and six miles from Camilla Dunum. This site remains unlocated, but one wonders, but one wonders whether the Henbury Stone discovery points to the location of either the Vicus itself or an unrecognised villa. I'd certainly recommend that an assessment of the round tower at Henbury Stone uh, is carried out looking for, looking for evidence of a reuse of Roman CBM, as is found in many other church towers in the Stour Valley area, such as Wormingford, Langham, Alphamstone and Keddington. The presence of this burial, the rumours of the proximity of sex threads burial sites, and the discovery of an astal with its possible Episcopal links, point to the church farm area as being a site of some significance over the long durée. It's sites like this that attract archaeologists and metal detectorists alike, drawn like bees to the honey of complex landscape palimpsests, impressive chronologies and exciting artefact assemblages. Inexorably, the gravitational pull of antiquity pulls digger and detectorist inwards. Perhaps the ultimate aspiration that this gravitational pull will become so strong that, as with a black hole, space and time are no longer interrelated realities, but merge indistinguishably and cease to have any independent meaning. Yet despite these centripetal forces bringing archaeologists and detectorists to the same central foci, there is another centrifugal force that compels them to spend time at the edge, literal spatial edges, field edges, porter cabins, compounds, but also social edges, the pub, the parish hall, and the gazebo, above all, the gazebo. It's in their spatial arrangement that detectorists and archaeologists share parallel lives. The materiality and modality of their ecological niches are scarily similar. The gazebo, the parish hall, the pub, all habitats within which the DMDC and professional archaeologists are at home, providing them with shelter, offering arenas for sociality, and just perhaps a protective carapace that can help shape and structure social interactions with the wider general public. It's possibly my favourite picture of British archaeology. <laughs> there are a few archaeologists who have not spent some time sat behind folding tables in a parish hall overseeing handling collections or holding down a reluctant gazebo at a site open day when it wants to convert itself into a kite in the merest presence of a slight breeze. Both detectorists and diggers are familiar with the flight to the pub at the end of a long day on site. As age creeps up and family life intrudes, the pub becomes an important liminal space that buffers the demands of depression and family life. Although family responsibility is the aspiration to reach the pub, is often trumped by the pragmatics of caring duties. Both groups are adept at creating temporary spaces of sociability, under canvas, under top hauling, under trees. 
Ja. Ja. Bloody hell. Ah, that's better. Places where social dynamics are maintained and continued. We see this at the trench edge, the field edge, the rally, the excavation, and even just perhaps at the conference. These spaces are crucial in maintaining conviviality. This might be defined as sharing at one level a meaningful interaction by means of a common interest, which in superficial but real ways translate a group of individuals into a collective. Definitely a conference. But this conviviality is not just about interactions and communities of people. It's also about the assemblage of the past and the present, the assemblage that brings people, landscapes and objects into a creative and socialised relationship. The activities of archaeologists and the DMC are as much about constituting a collective imagination of the past that persists into the present as a more instrumental goal of artefact or data recovery. And to do this, they share more in common than they think. As framed by the social theorist Ivan Illich, this is truly convivial activity. Conviviality defined by him as autonomous and creative intercourse amongst persons and the intercourse of persons with their environment. Michael Givens at Glasgow, who's one of the relatively few archaeologists who's actually explored this notion, has emphasised that thinking about conviviality celebrates the shifting, emerging, fading, struggling connections and interdependencies which in their unfathomable complexity constitute life. And it's precisely these relationships and interdependencies that echo outwards into social and material networks, backwards into the past, projecting into the future. Perhaps the most important message of the work of the DMDC, many of you will have seen the documentary, and its members, though is perhaps a wider moral one, and one that regrettably is more pertinent and timely than I realised when I first thought about this paper. This message is that human connections with the past and the practices and structures within them which aim to reconstitute them, whether through subjective narrative and imaginative engagement or through a more cool, distanced collecting and collating of data, are both invariably made better by humility, generosity, and by cultivating human and humane relationships with each other and the past. I leave you with this final clip from Detectorist to reflect upon my last message. I'll do very well not to cry at this. Ice button, Welsh Guards, Second Infantry. Thank you.